Welcome to the Cornell Entrepreneur Network sponsored webinar. This one is entitled Ezra Cornell, Cornell University's First Entrepreneur. I'm Tommy Bruce, Vice President for University Communications, and I'm delighted to be here today with all of you. 146 years today, uh, on this very date, the New York City legislator, the New York uh, legislator signed into existence uh, our great university. And so therefore it's very fitting on this day to be both celebrating and acknowledging that, uh, that date and also talking about our founder who would found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. And uh, with, from the get-go, this uh, university, which was understood from the very beginning as the first truly American university, was also the original Opportunity University. And to help us think about uh, the meaning of all this, the, uh, the vision that had to be uh, uh, entertained by Ezra Connell to, in order to be able to create this uh, university, we have Corey Earl with us, known to many of you as uh, our budding historian in residence. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Corey is the Associate Director of Student Programs in the Office of Alumni Affairs. He's a 2007 graduate of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. He works in, uh, he has worked in the rare books and manuscripts collections of uh, Kroc Library as a reference specialist. And so I think it's uh, in doing that that he has uh, found a lot of treasures to share with us and to remind us in our daily uh, activities about where we all come from. So uh, he has also worked uh, with the Cornell Daily Sun and uh, dear Uncle Ezra. Cornell is also on the Board of Trustees of the History Center of Tompkins County. So, um, but before I let uh, Corey join us in this conversation and start uh, talking to you about the subject of today's uh, webinar, there are some, a little bit of business that I like to remind people at the beginning of webinars, and that is how to communicate with us. So you, you um, can see at the bottom of your, of your uh, browser here, there is a little hand waving person. Oh, it's actually up here at the top in the middle. Well, if you click on that, that will indicate to me that you are actually ready to ask a live question. Otherwise, please do not hesitate to use the chat box right there and to type in your question. I'll try to, uh, while, while Corey is working on answering your questions and telling you about the history of Cornell University, I will uh, monitor those questions. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Corey Earle. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's, I'm really happy to be here. This is my first one of these webinars, and I hope you'll enjoy learning a little bit about who Ezra Cornell was. Uh, it's really fitting and appropriate that today is founding day, the anniversary of, of the, really the creation of Cornell University's charter. And it used to be, actually, that uh, Cornell University would celebrate Founders Day uh, on Ezra Cornell's birthday, which is January 11th, uh, 1807. So it used to be that every January 11th, the university would, would cease operations and, and have a major holiday on Founders Day. Unfortunately, uh, the university isn't in session uh, in January these days. It used to be that classes went through January, so Founders Day has kind of been lost as a holiday. Uh, so we took this opportunity on Founding Day to, to celebrate our founder, Ezra Cornell. And it was at a, a Founders Day celebration, actually, years ago in 1887, that a speech was given that I think sums up why we think Ezra Cornell is important to talk about today and, and what the purpose of this webinar is. Uh, and so a speech at that Founders Day celebration in 1887 was given by Francis Finch, who was a trustee, a charter trustee of the university, and uh, actually the second dean of Cornell's law school. And he, he said, I trust that through all vicissitudes and changes, however the new may supersede the old, in time and death blur or efface the past, there may yet remain at the center, as the center of every aim and ambition, as the stimulus to every useful effort, as the atmosphere of the university, the memory of Ezra Cornell. So that's what we're here today to talk about, the memory of Ezra Cornell and, and really who Ezra Cornell was. I think a lot of students go through the university and they, they know the name Ezra Cornell certainly and they maybe know a little bit about where he made his money or, or they certainly would recognize the beard, uh, but they maybe don't know the full story behind who Ezra was and what he did uh, to earn his money and, and really the vision he had to create Cornell University. So that's going to be our topic today. Uh, so it's in that spirit that, that we'll get started. Ezra really was a renaissance man uh, of many talents, many interests, and a lot of different careers. And I think he epitomized what it meant to, to be an entrepreneur, which is why we're doing today's webinar for the Cornell Entrepreneur Network. It's really appropriate since Ezra was Cornell University's first entrepreneur. 
Uh, he was an innovator, he was a leader, he was a hard worker, uh, and he was willing to take on risk to, to make a change in the world. And, and he was persistent with his beliefs. If he be uh, believed that, that he could make a change or that, that his idea needed to be implemented, he would, would push through all odds and, and make it happen. And that's really what led to the creation of our university. So we'll start at the beginning uh, with Ezra's birth. Uh, he was born, as I mentioned, January 11th, uh, 1807, uh, actually born in Westchester, uh, and he was the oldest of 10 siblings, so he had quite a large family. Uh, and the family moved when he was a, a young child to DeRyder, which is about 40 miles or so away from Ithaca. So he, he moved to upstate New York, not too far away. And uh, he wasn't wealthy, uh, wasn't born into a wealthy family by any means. His father was a, a potter, actually, uh, and supporting a family of, of so many children. Uh, he's the eldest of ten siblings, so supporting a, a family of ten children on a potter's salary was difficult. So, so certainly the family wasn't well off. Uh, and the, the family moved to a farm in Derider, and uh, Ezra, from a very early age, was particularly interested in education. Uh, and. Uh, You'll see that in, throughout his life, education was a, a keynote uh, throughout. And so it, it comes up very early in his career when he was a young child. His father actually told him that if he could attend school for three months, if he cleared four acres of forest uh, in, in order to create a cornfield. Uh, so Ezra, not having any formal opportunity for education, this was his chance to get an education. So he took it upon himself to clear four acres of forest to create a cornfield in order just to, to attend three months of of formal schooling as a young child. Uh, I thought, so I think it's neat that you see very early on in his life uh, that Ezra was interested in education. And we'll, we'll pull up a slide, actually. We, we do have some visuals throughout the presentation to help, uh, help move it along. So our first slide, actually, you'll see Ezra's parents there, uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Cornell. Uh, so the, around the time they, they moved to Derider uh, in Ezra's uh, youth, and uh, so his interest in education comes in again early on, actually in the purchase of his first book. And it's a neat item that we have in the archives, so I wanted to highlight that. Uh, whenever you're back on campus, I, I highly recommend checking out the Kroc Library, uh, Rare and Manuscript Collections, where they have a lot of these treasures. Uh, but this particular book, he, he pulled it out later in his life and, and wrote an inscription in it. And it says, this is the first book I ever owned. It was offered by a peddler at my farmer's house in DeRyder, Madison County, New York. I persuaded my mother to buy it for me. She had no money, and to oblige me, she picked up paper rags about the house to make up the price of it. I read the book with interest, but when Jackson was a candidate in 1828 for the presidency, I opposed him and voted for Adams. I favored a protective terrace. T uh, tariff, Ezra Cornell. So the book was actually uh, Memoirs of Andrew Jackson, and it shows that, that early on in Ezra's, uh, you know, in his career, he was interested in education and he wanted this book, and, and even though the family couldn't really afford a book, uh, his, his mom did what she could to, to help Ezra educate himself. Which brings us actually to Ezra's ciphering book, uh, another item uh, that you can check out in the archives. And Ezra's ciphering book was, was basically a blank book that he kept track of every cent he earned and spent as a young man. So from an early age, uh, as well as being interested in education, he was interested in, in economics and finance and making sure that he wasn't spending more than he earned. Uh, so you see the, the early signs of a, a budding entrepreneur uh, in, in young Ezra. And he also would, you can see in the book that he would teach himself math, he would do some times tables here and there. And we'll get back to the ciphering book a little later because he actually pulls it out later in life. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. So as a young man, uh, Ezra was uh, actually took an interest in carpentry. Uh, and he, at the age of 19, amazed his, his uh, neighbors and, and community by constructing almost a, a perfect house for his family with no form, formal training. So he hadn't been an apprentice as a, a young carpenter, really taught himself the trade, and at the age of 19 constructed a house and, and was really the envy of his community for, for having such fine craftsmanship. Uh, and, and it's at that point in his early 20s, a couple years later, that he, he decides to make his own way in the world and he, he leaves the family uh, into Ryder and, and heads to Ithaca, New York. Ithaca was sort of a, a budding uh, community, uh, industry really picking up there, a lot of mills being the main industry. So he arrives in his early 20s, in, in 1828 actually. Uh, and uh, so he, he has a few jobs as a carpenter around the community. Uh, and then he becomes a mechanic for a cotton mill, and the mill was actually owned by Otis Eddy. So some of you might recognize that name as the uh, the namesake of Eddy Street in College Town. Eddy, uh, Ezra worked as a, a mechanic for the mill, and uh, because of his success there, he was hired by another local businessman, Jeremiah Beebe. 
another name you might recognize as the, the namesake of, of BB Lake. So we worked for the, the plaster and flour mills of Jeremiah BB and actually became a manager of them. And it was, was while working for, for uh, BB that uh, he had a major impact on the community and that he actually created what is now BB Lake. Uh, it was Ezra who was in charge of the damming of Triphammer Falls. Uh, he led that effort that created what was known as BB Pond uh, at that point. It was a little smaller. And another thing, you'll see an image uh, of a tunnel uh, next to young Ezra, and it was Ezra who built a 200-foot tunnel. He actually blasted it through the, the gorge walls to bring water from Fall Creek to the mills downstream. So this is in Fall Creek Gorge, and you can actually still see the tunnel today. And this is another example of Ezra's real uh, ingenuity. Uh, it, he blasted the tunnel, there's a 200 foot tunnel, and he blasted it from both sides and it actually connected in the middle uh, with less than an inch off. It was considered a major feat of engineering that this young man was able to do that and create this, this tunnel blasting from both sides. And it's important to note a little bit about Ezra's family at this point. Uh, Ezra married Mary Ann Wood in 1831 and she was a native of Dryden, New York, not too far away. And the most important thing to note here is that Ezra was a Quaker and that Mary was an Episcopalian. Uh, and, and it wasn't appropriate for Quakers to marry outside the faith. Uh, so Ezra was actually told by his church that, that this was inappropriate and that he wasn't welcome uh, with his, his Quaker church anymore. And Ezra demonstrates his, his stubbornness a little bit at this point. Uh, his rebellious streak comes out. But it also demonstrates Ezra's firm conviction in his beliefs, and, and you see a little bit of his uh, disgust with organized religion having a say in sort of controlling people's lives, which was one reason that Cornell University was founded as a non-sectarian institution open to people of all faiths. Uh, he, he didn't think that religion should have a say in people's lives in that way, although he was a, a devoutly religious man. Uh, so the church actually told Ezra that you know, he wasn't welcome in the, the church anymore, and he wrote back and said, I have always considered that choosing a companion for life was a very important affair, and that my happiness or misery in this life depended on the choice, and for that reason I never felt myself bound to be dictated in the affair by any higher authority than my own feelings. Uh, so he, he very strongly stated that, that marrying his wife was the best decision he'd made, and uh, he wasn't going to, to change that decision based on his, his faith. Uh, you see a little bit of Ezra's curmudgeonly streak coming out here, uh, which uh, he was known for, if you ask his friends. He was a stubborn man, a little bit of a curmudgeon, but, but deep down he genuinely cared about other people's well-being uh, and was very well liked by the early students at, at Cornell because of that. Uh, one of my favorite stories is actually of a, an early Cornell student who came to Ezra uh, at his house and asked for an autograph. Uh, the student was a little starstruck. This was the founder of the university. And Ezra took the, the book or piece of paper that the student asked him to sign and wrote, I don't like to be bothered when I'm at meals. And that was the autograph Ezra gave to the student. <laughs> uh, so a little more about Ezra's family. This is the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, they really uh, lived through decades of poverty and hardship. Uh, Ezra still is not, uh, has not made his fortune. He's working for mills, uh, really not making a lot of money. And he had nine children, uh, and only five of them ended up living to adulthood. So he had a fairly rough life. A number of children uh, died in infancy, uh, and, and trying to support those, those five children who made it to adulthood uh, on such a small salary was difficult for him uh, and his wife. And in 1837, you have the panic of 1837 when the economy collapses, really. Uh, a lot of banks closed, and, and Ezra actually ended up being laid off. Uh, so. You see a challenge, entrepreneurs face many challenges in their, their careers, and this is Ezra facing one of his earlier ones. He loses his job, and, and BB actually ends up closing the mills. Uh, so it's at this point that Ezra decides to experiment with a few other projects, like a good entrepreneur. Uh, he, he tried raising sheep, uh, shorthorn cattle, and he actually ran a grocery store for a little while in Ithaca, New York. Tried his hand at a lot of different things. And it's during this period that he really gets interested in agriculture as well. Uh, he had grown up on a farm and, and done some farming then, uh, became very active uh, within Tompkins County in the agricultural scene. Uh, and he was frequently a judge and a mar marshal at the Tompkins County Agricultural Fair, uh, the New York State Fair as well. He would go to the New York State Fair and, and, and serve as a judge there. Uh, eventually, he would actually become president of the Tompkins County and New York State Agricultural Societies uh, in the 1850s, a few decades later. So it's at this point that Ezra's uh, career takes a, a turn, and he actually purchases the patent rights in 1842 for a plow. Uh, and he purchases the patent rights in only two states, Maine and Georgia. 
Uh, unfortunately, these two states aren't particularly close to each other, so he had the challenge of traveling between Maine and Georgia to sell this plow. Uh, so he, he became a salesman at this point and uh, traveled between these two, two states, often walking on foot between Maine and Georgia for most, much of the trip, and, and was a salesman. Uh, and it's on one of these trips to Maine, actually, that his career really uh, takes off. He walked into a friend's office, F.O.J. Smith was the, the man's name. He'd met him on a previous trip to Maine, and then the next year he came back and stopped by his office. And Smith was working with a man named Samuel Morse. Uh, I assume that many of you will recognize that name as the, the founder of the Telegraph, or the inventor of the Telegraph. So Morse uh, had hired Smith uh, to figure out a plow that would lay telegraph cable underground uh, and then bury it back up. Uh, the telegraph had just been invented. They were trying to figure out a way to really have it take off as the next big communication industry. Uh, and the most important thing was finding a way to connect all of these cities, major cities in the Northeast, with telegraph cable. And Smith was, was challenged with that, uh, that uh, you know, aspect of, of trading a plow to lay the telegraph cable. And Ezra said, oh, I can do that, no problem. Let me, let me help you out. So Ezra had the fortuitous uh, occasion of walking into the office while Smith was working on it, took on the challenge of building the plow, and successfully created a plow that would lay the cable underground and then bury it back up. Unfortunately, the wiring of the telegraph cable wasn't particularly uh, effective, and uh, it would actually, the cable would break, uh, water, water would seep in and cause the cable to, to break between cities, and if the cable breaks, you, you, the telegraph wouldn't, wouldn't be successful, of course. Uh, so. It was Ezra who pointed this out, that there really was an issue with the defective cable, and they needed to do something about it, and Morse said, okay, we need to halt laying of the telegraph cable and figure this out, but we don't want the press to find out. We don't want newspapers to begin talking about this failing telegraph, and it's not going to work out. And Ezra had the creative solution of, of telling one of the workmen who was plowing, uh, laying the cable, to accidentally run it into a rock. Uh, so the, the, the plow hit a rock, they said the plow had broken, and they couldn't lay cable anymore, and that bought them some time to figure out how to deal with this defective wiring. And it was Ezra who did the research. Uh, he did a lot of research on uh, magnetism and, and on the telegraph. And he realized that the, the best option would be glass insulated poles. Uh, lay the cable uh, above ground instead of below ground. And so you can thank Ezra for popularizing the telephone pole that is so ubiquitous today. Uh, Ezra had the idea of putting the cable on these poles and stringing it uh, throughout the northeast between cities that way instead of burying it underground. And so he ended up being hired by Samuel Morse to be his assistant for about $1,000 a year, or uh, $23,000 or so in, in today's dollars. So another career for Ezra, now he's working for Morse as the, the telegraph industry takes off. Uh, Cornell actually has the original telegraph receiver. Uh, I believe it's in the College of Engineering. Uh, that's the image you'll see right now. That is the first telegraph receiver that received that, that first message. Uh, that was the, the line, the message from Baltimore to Washington, the, what hath God wrought? Uh, and it was Ezra who laid that telegraph line between Baltimore and Washington. And some people might not know this, but if you look at the statue of Ezra Cornell on the art squad, uh, he's actually standing next to that telegraph receiver. It's sort of behind him, but that is the telegraph receiver that was included as, as part of the statue of honoring our founders, since the telegraph industry had such a, a big impact on his career. So the telegraph industry in its, in its early years was really a tumultuous industry. Uh, there were a lot of different companies forming once it became successful, a lot of lawsuits between companies, a lot of unreliable service as well as lines would be broken, uh, issues would come up. And Ezra was very confident though. Ezra felt that this was the industry that, that would be successful. He thought it was going to grow and grow, and he was right. Uh, unfortunately, it caused some struggles for his family because he decided to take most of his pay in stock. Uh, so instead of getting paychecks up front uh, to help support his wife and the kids, he was taking the pay in stock, and they were really struggling to get by during this period. But uh, he left his family destitute for a little period, but he really felt that you know this was going to pay off in the long run. Uh, he took some risk, and it, it worked out for him. He became the largest stockholder in the, the telegraph company that he had invested in, and uh, that's when we, we have the, the beginning of his fortune beginning to be amassed. Uh, Hiram Sibley comes on the scene at this point, another name that many of you will recognize, uh, the namesake of Sibley Hall, and it was Sibley who'd founded another telegraph company, it was actually Ezra's chief rival, uh, and Sibley had the bright idea of buying up all these smaller companies and beginning to combine them and make one big conglomerate to have more reliable service and, and just one company to get rid of all this infighting between the telegraph companies. So he and Ezra actually decide to, to go into business together. He uh, 
they, they merge and create uh, one company in, in 1855 that is named Western Union. And it was Ezra who had picked the name Western Union, and Ezra became the, the largest stockholder in this new company, uh, which is, is a name many of us are familiar with. So the telegraph takes off, Ezra begins to amass a fortune in, in stock in Western Union, and uh, we, we begin to see the, the beginnings of Cornell University uh, on the horizon at this point. So it's during this period in his life, Ezra begins to have a little more personal success, a little more career success, and he, he dabbles in politics. Uh, he'd always been interested in, in sort of public service, been very involved in his community, uh, and he had been affiliated with the Whig Party and, and a strong proponent of the Whig Party early on. And he often wrote about the curse of slavery, as he called it. So when the Republican Party was formed by a, a large number of, of sort of an anti-slavery coalition put together with the Republican Party, Ezra was one of the first people to, to join this new party, and he actually was a delegate to the first National uh, Republican Convention in 1856. Uh, so Ezra was actually in attendance at Abraham Lincoln's inauguration. Uh, I see a photo there of, of the inaugural, inaugural ceremony, and, and Ezra was, was very proud to be part of this moment in history. He wrote in his diary, I, I got near enough to hear most of the president's address, which was forcibly delivered. Uh, in 1860, Ezra runs for the New York State Legislature, and uh, he, he ends up chairing the Committee on Agriculture because of his experience farming and, and being involved in the state agriculture uh, scene. And in 1863, he moves from the Assembly to the Senate. He runs for the New York State Senate and joins that. Uh, so you see him getting more and more involved in, in politics on a state level beyond just Tompkins County, uh, and on the national level with his uh, interest in, in Abraham Lincoln's inauguration. Uh, of course, this is the, the time of the Civil War, uh, beginning in 1861, and Ezra, having a, a Quaker upbringing, uh, was very interested in peace. Uh, he emphasized peace uh, throughout his life, and he wrote, uh, it is wrong to fight in any way, and nine-tenths of the fighting between nations in wrong is wrong. And he wrote this in a letter to his son, Alonzo Cornell, who incidentally would go on to be governor of New York State himself. Uh, and he asked his son not to become one of, quote, an agent in the hands of the government for taking the lives of his fellow beings. He didn't think, you know, people should be fighting. He, he didn't, you know, approve of the Civil War uh, in any way. But he was active in the war effort, and he actually headed a citizens' committee to organize aid for the dependents of volunteers uh, in Tompkins County. And he personally subscribed $1,000 of his own money to, to support the war effort in that way. Uh, his wife, Marianne Cornell, was actually the, the president of the Ladies' Volunteer Aid Association in Tompkins County during the Civil War. And Ezra traveled to the front. He traveled to the battlefront uh, with medical supplies to deliver to troops. Uh, he would visit hospitals, deliver, uh, visit camps, uh, specifically those where troops from Tompkins County were based. Uh, and he ended up getting caught in the middle of the first Battle of Bull Run on one of these trips and saw fighting uh, up front. Uh, but he, he was very, he, he felt strongly, although he didn't agree with the fighting, he felt strongly about supporting the effort of the Union and uh, delivering medical supplies. Uh, despite uh, his involvement in politics and his involvement in the Civil War, uh, aiding the troops, he wasn't satisfied yet with his philanthropy and he still wanted to do more for his community. And you begin to see really his, his strong interest in philanthropy at this point. Uh, so this is when we return to that ciphering book I'd mentioned earlier. It was the book that, that Ezra had kept notes in as a young child uh, about his you know, every bit of income and every expense. Uh, and he returned to this book at this point uh, and, and wrote in it again. He hadn't used it in years, uh, but he, he pulled it back out and he wrote, In 1844 there was a balance of perhaps of a, a couple thousand dollars on the credit side. In 1854, the contest was a doubtful one, and a debt with which I was then encumbered amounting to $50,000 would probably have swept the board if the game had been stopped at that period. But the contest has been continued, with increasing success for the side of gang, and at the present period, February 1st, 1860, that mountain of debt has mostly been paid at the rate of 100 cents on a dollar, with 7% interest added, and a yearly income of $15,000 seems to be a reliable guarantee that the credit side has won the victory. And he wrote that in 1860, uh, so it's, he's beginning to get involved in politics at that period. It's at the, the telegraph industry, Western Union had been formed in 1855, so it's been five years of his involvement in Western Union. And he's beginning to make a considerable sum of money, uh, despite the fact that you know, only ten years earlier he was in, in a huge amount of debt. And then he, he added again, the favorable change indicated above, which promised to give a favorable turn to the lifelong loss and gang account continues. The yearly income which I realized this year will exceed $100,000. My last quarterly dividend on stock in the Western Union Telegraph Company was $35,000, July 20th, 1864. 
The dividend for October quarter will be as large. My greatest care now is how to spend this large income to do the most good to those who are properly dependent on me, to the poor and to posterity, Ezra Cornell. And so you see there, he wants to do the most good for society. He wants to do the most good for those who depended on him. And he has this fortune, and he's not quite sure what to do with it. And he really wants to support his values of hard work and of education, two things that had been really keynotes throughout his life. Uh, and, and those are the things he wants to, to uh, really focus on. So you begin to see early elements of his philanthropy. In Tompkins County, Ezra actually created the Cornell Public Library, uh, which is the predecessor of today's Tompkins County Public Library system. And that was really his first act of major philanthropy. Uh, he, he built the library in 1863, just a couple years before Cornell University was founded. And he also got involved with the Cascadilla Sanitarium, which was a, a project of a, a local nurse who wanted to create a facility that would uh, be used as an educational facility for nurses and also sort of a convalescent home for, for the ill. Uh, though it never ended up taking off and the building, uh, as many of you know, ended up becoming Cornell's first dormitory. It was never actually used as the sanitarium that, that had been hoped for. But he did invest in that and was one of the, the early trustees for the proposed Cascadilla Sanitarium. Uh, he wrote during this period, I have five children. It would not benefit them to, get, it would not benefit them to give them more than $100,000 each. Thus, less than half is disposed of. The library will probably absorb $60,000, but supposing it to go to $75,000, what shall I do with the balance? I hope to do much good with it, but I really don't know how to dispose of it in a will so as to do the good with it that I should desire to do. So he has a quandary. He's not sure what to do with the, the rest of his money. He's given the library. He's helped a number of smaller causes. But, but what do I do with my fortune? I don't want to give it to my children. Uh, they should make their own way in the world. And it's while uh, in Europe, actually, in 1863, he attends an international agricultural expedition, uh, exposition. And he, he writes, uh, inquire what the effect of large endowments are upon colleges. How many graduates do they send out, etc. And this is after a visit to Oxford. So he begins to think about universities and colleges, and maybe he could have some involvement in that. Uh, and it's around this time, uh, the late 1850s, actually, that Ezra purchases a farm uh, in Tompkins County, which is the present-day art squad in sort of West Campus. Uh, the 300-acre farm called Forest Home uh, that he, he purchased in 1857. So you have this idea of, of he's interested in education, uh, he's beginning, the wheels are turning in his head, and uh, he has some money, and he has a farm, and that's when the Morrill Land Grant Act is passed, uh, 1862. And this act, I won't get into the, the details of it, but basically the, the U.S. federal government, this is the first piece of federal uh, education legislation, it gives land to every state in the United States uh, to be used to create a college or university that would teach agriculture, mechanic arts, or engineering, and military tactics, since this is during the, the Civil War. Uh, so that combined with, uh, with Ezra's philanthropy and interest, it was really the perfect combination of timing and, and people. And, and that was the, the story of, of how Ezra Cornell really made his money and, and founded Cornell University. So I'll stop right here. Uh, many of you know sort of the, the early days of Cornell and, and the story behind the founding. And I'll, I'll stop here at the towards the close of Ezra's life and, and ask, uh, see if there are any questions from the, the audience. So, um, uh, Corey, while, uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come up, uh, there's uh, one, uh, uh, you know, the founder's statement about, um, uh, uh, I would found, uh, I, thank you, I would found an institution, et cetera, et cetera, for any person, any study. That there it might have been actually said uh, by Andrew White and not by him. So can you can you can you clarify that uh, that mystery for us? Sure. So I'm I'm sure many of you are familiar with the the motto of the university. I would found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study, uh, and that's credited to Ezra Cornell and and really set the the vision for Cornell University as any person in any study, which were the two incredibly unique and really radical elements of Cornell's founding, which we we didn't get into in this discussion. Uh, but some people have actually suggested that the quote was too eloquent for Ezra to have said it. They, they thought maybe it was Andrew Dixon White as the, the more classically trained scholar, the more educated of the two founders who said it. Uh, but I think most historians actually agree that it was Ezra who said it. And the reason is that Andrew Dixon White would never have been as unrealistic to say any person in any study. He was, he was more of a realist, less of the visionary uh, with Cornell's founding. 
and would have known that it's impossible to have any person in any study. Well, Ezra was the visionary who, who really set the founding ideals in the university and said, no, we, we should have a school where anything can be taught, anyone can attend, and that was what, what he believed in. So I would say Ezra did, did uh, say the, the motto, and it wasn't white. So, so the motto really does, in fact, reflect uh, the life and times of Ezra Cornell. Tell, tell us a little bit about the relationship between these two gentlemen, and uh, what was that like? What does history tell us about them? So Andrew Dixon White and Ezra Cornell were, were very different individuals, uh, and they actually met in the New York State uh, Legislature. Ezra was one of the oldest members of the legislature, White was one of the youngest members. Uh, and Ezra, as I mentioned, was chairing the Committee on Agriculture. White was chairing the Committee on Education. And these were two areas of, of the legislature that really didn't interact that much, uh, education and agriculture. So it was the passing of the Morrill Act that really brought the two together, because uh, you have this act that's to establish colleges and universities, but it's to teach agriculture. The, the Morrill Act was passed really because there was a need for practical education in the United States, a need for agricultural education since farming was such a major industry. So this, this, the two come together during this discussion and, and they realize that Ezra has all of this money that he's interested in, in giving to a good cause, something he supports, and, and we know he's certainly interested in education. And you have White, who was uh, considered one of the most educated people in the country. He'd been educated throughout Europe, a uh, graduate of Yale. Uh, he'd been a professor at the University of Michigan and, and taught a little bit at Yale. And he had this vision of a, a university that was the, the quintessential American university that brought together elements of sort of the classical uh, schools like Yale and Harvard, but also elements from the German universities, uh, particularly the laboratory model, and less of recitation and memorization, but more discussion and real learning with faculty. So we wanted to uh, combine all of these elements into the first American university, into this unique university. And so it was his vision of, of that, along with Ezra's real interest in, in creating uh, a, a legacy with his, his uh, philanthropy and with his wealth, and doing something for the, the good of society that brought the two of them together. So w one of the personal observations I've noted uh, in, uh, when coming up to Upper State in uh, New York is why, some people always ask me, why is uh, Cornell in Tompkins County? Uh, is it right to remind people that in uh, the 19th century, actually upstate New York was an economic, uh, it, it was a happening place economically and otherwise? It's true. You have uh, the Erie Canal is actually connected to Ithaca through Cuyahoga Lake, and, and you have a canal system. You have the, the gorges in Ithaca, which, which you know, led to a lot of mills and, and industry really growing in that sense. So it was a, a, a budding industrial community. You have uh, a lot of businesses like Ithaca Gun, for instance, that, that had a long career, uh, founded around you know, in the 1800s. So it really was a, a pretty, you know, less of a, it wasn't just, just Cornell in Ithaca. It wasn't an empty community until Cornell came along. It was a, a vibrant community before the university was founded, certainly. So, so when uh, the first class gathered here, and I'm waiting for some questions to come up, but let me just ask this question. It was a very large class, right, that, uh, that uh, convened in 1868? It was. So the, the university was such a unique, sort of different kind of university that it got a lot of press, uh, some negative, uh, some positive. So when it opened in, in 1868, it took them a few years after the, the sign of the charter to, to build the buildings and recruit faculty. But the first class arrived in 1868, and it was the largest entering class of any American university up to that point, 412 students, which today doesn't seem that large, but uh, it was pretty a big group uh, for that, that day and age. So I have now two questions. I have uh, John Weir, who's raised his hand, and so it would be, uh, the, I would be love to hear your question. John, go ahead. And then after that, I have Stuart Mitchell, who's written something in to us. John? So, uh, this is a very, sim very simple question, but in 1864, what was $100,000 uh, worth in today's dollars? That is a good question. I actually don't know what the the exchange rate on that would be, uh, but I, w I would guess it would put Ezra in the, the millionaire category in, in today's dollars. So we're, we're going to try to see if we can look that up right away and give you the answer. In, in the meantime, uh, Stuart Mitchell uh, writes Pathstone Corporation, formerly known as Rural Opportunities, Inc., administrative, uh, their, their administrative headquarters is housed in the Hiram Sibley Mansion in Rochester. We have done some research on Hiram. I'd be interested in knowing more about the relationship between Ezra and Hiram. 
Uh, sure, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, as I'd mentioned, they were actually competitors, so the, it, the beginning of their relationship wasn't a particularly friendly one, as my understanding. Uh, but when the when Western Union was formed and the, the companies came together as a conglomerate, they began working together. They, they both agreed that really merging the telegraph companies together instead of all these smaller companies infighting was, was the way to go. And Ezra actually convinced uh, Sibley to believe in sort of these, these unique educational ideals that Ezra had along with Andrew Dixon White. And uh, Sibley bought into this radical university idea, the school that had any person in any study, and became a major philanthropist and a major benefactor in the university, as did his son. Uh, both, both members of the Sibley family helped fund the early engineering college and actually created the Sibley School of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, it was its own college uh, in, in the university's early days and is now part of the, the College of Engineering as a whole. So. Um uh, while we're waiting for some more questions, I, I just want to um, uh, sort of ha have you uh, paint for us, uh, 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 going back to this uh, inaugural moment of the university, what was it like? Can you describe uh, what Inauguration Day might have been like? What, what happened? Who came? Uh, sure. Were there political leaders who came to Ithaca? What, what, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's an interesting point, actually, because the governor of New York declined to come, uh, and one of the reasons was the amount of negative press that Cornell was receiving. So the governor wasn't sure if it would be a good idea to be spotted here, even though this was the, the land-grant university of, of New York State. And, and, and it was the, he was the same governor who uh, signed the paper, I believe it right? was. I think it was Reuben Fenton, the, the one right. who signed the charter. This is towards the end of his, his term in office. And, he decided that, that maybe it wasn't the, the best idea to be there, and I believe he sent his lieutenant governor instead. Uh, the, the ceremony was actually held downtown. Uh, there wasn't much on campus at this point. They built Morrill Hall and, and White Hall, which were called South and North Hall at the time. And uh, so actually the inaugural ceremony for the, the launching of this new endeavor was held at the Cornell Public Library, this building that Ezra had given a couple years earlier. Uh, as the, the the community's public library, so that was the the big grand hall where everyone gathered for this inaugural ceremony. And uh, and uh, so so uh, at the time, uh, what this was, uh, how would you describe this in in the life of Tompkins County? What 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 was going on at that time? I think the community was was thrilled to have this new university. It was certainly bringing a lot of attention to the community. Uh, and, and as, as we know today, Cornell is a, a vibrant part of, of the Ithaca community, and a major employer, etc. So I think Ithacans were aware that this was the start of something big. Uh, and you actually, there was a book published a couple of years before Cornell was founded, and it was actually dedicated to Ezra Cornell. And it mentions the grand halls that he will build here. It was after the, the plans for the university were in place, but the university itself wasn't in place. So it's interesting that the author of a, a book about Ithaca mentions and dedicates the book to Ezra for, for having such an impact on the community and, and his philanthropy, you know, creating the public library system. He was very well respected. So, so it was a moment of hope, but as uh, uh, Rene uh, Fondacaro writes here to you, says she has a question, and uh, the question is why was there so much negative press about the university's founding? So the negative press stemmed from, from the university being having these radical ideas about it, and it's really that motto, the any person in any study element. So I, I tend to break down any person into five different pieces. Uh, one of them is any gender. Uh, Cornell was really one of the first major institutions to be co-educational. There were, were small women's schools there, but most uh, in institutions were men only. There were a couple schools that had co-education, but certainly none on the, the scale and scope uh, of Cornell University. Second element was, was uh, ethnic diversity. Any person uh, referred to people of any race. Uh, and this is the close of the Civil War, so certainly a, a very radical concept in that sense as well. Uh, third element, any nationality. We had a lot of students, uh, international students, coming to, to Cornell. In the early years, it was called the most cosmopolitan university in the United States because it had such a large international student population. And the fourth element was really the, the most radical one that got the most uh, negative attention, and that was Cornell was a non-sectarian university, any religion. Uh, it was open to students who were of no faith, or uh, Jewish students, Muslim students, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Episcopalian, it didn't matter what faith you were, uh, you were welcome at Cornell University. And this really wasn't the case uh, for most institutions at, at that time. Uh, most of the other major universities had boards of trustees that were all of one particular sect or faith, uh, and, and the student bodies were the same way. 
So they, a lot of prominent clergymen actually accused Cornell University of being a godless institution or the heathens on the hill sort of thing. Uh, and and it got a lot of attention in major newspapers uh, and the, from major clergymen telling, you know, don't send your children to the godless institution, don't send your children to Cornell. Well, uh, to, to this, uh, uh, around this point, uh, Frank Dawson points out that many years ago he came across a letter in the archives uh, dated sometime in the mid-1800s from a colored student inquiring about uh, possible admissions to Cornell. The response from Ezra was encouraging, stating that he would consider admissions of a qualified colored student even if all the other students would leave as a result. Can you sort of uh, share some more thoughts about that? That's a true story, yeah. Ezra did receive letters uh, when the university was founded from, from students of color saying, you know, are, are we welcome at this new university? And, and he was always very much in support of that. Uh, the first black students arrived at Cornell in the 1870s um, and, and were incorporated into student life. and. Uh, as many of you probably know, Alpha Phi Alpha was founded at Cornell University, which was the, the first Greek letter intercollegiate fraternity for African Americans, uh, founded at Cornell in 1906. Uh, they celebrated their centennial here just, just a few years ago, five years ago. Uh, so that was an important element of, of the university from the founding as well. So uh, a little parentheses here, the question about the $100,000 in 1864. Uh, would be worth something like 1.2, uh, one, so, so Chris Marshall uh, using the GDP comes to 1.180,000 uh, 1, and Jason Dupuy also did a calculation, he came out with $1,377,000 and thereabouts. So, uh, so it was a considerable sum of money. It was, and, and when the university was founded, Ezra actually gave a half million dollars of his own money. He gave $500,000 to, to launch the university along with the, the land grant funds. So that was really the, the in starting those days, point. In those days, that was, uh, that was serious. That money. was a big chunk of change. And it allowed for this realization. So going to, can you sort of take us through a little bit the years after the first decade and uh, tell us a little bit about what it, what it might have been like to be there, be at Cornell in, tw in, in 1875. Sure, so uh, Ezra actually uh, didn't live much past the founding of the university, which is unfortunate. Uh, the university students first arrived in 1868. Uh, the inauguration was in, in October 1868. And there wasn't much on campus at that point. You have a couple buildings, but basically it's, it's still a farm. Uh, you have cows roaming around the, the campus on the art squad. It was basically still a cow pasture. Uh, really no sidewalks or anything like that. Uh, muddy paths between buildings. Uh, so it wasn't the prettiest looking campus. Students talked about how the doors still hadn't arrived on some buildings when they, they got there. So it was, it was a work in progress in those early years. And uh, it really struggled during the 1870s uh, to make ends meet. Uh, they, they were having trouble paying faculty. Faculty salaries were very low. And, and basically, most of the early faculty were really volunteering a lot of their time to, to make Cornell happen because they believed in this unique university where uh, any person could attend. And then the any study element, meaning that uh, practical education was just as important as classical education. All academic subjects were considered equals at Cornell. So these early faculty really be believed in that and were here because they supported it, not because they were making much money. Uh, Ezra passed away in 1874, really towards the peak of these struggles for the university financially. Um, and also uh, in the 1870s, uh, really a revival of the negative press Cornell was receiving, specifically over uh, non-sectarianism. Uh, it's interesting to note that when Sage Hall was built, it was built as the Sage College for Women. It was the first dormitory for, for female students on campus. And this is in the early 1870s, and Ezra gave a speech at the laying of the cornerstone for this building, uh, the first real dormitory on campus. And he said in the speech that he was placing a letter in the cornerstone that would tell why Cornell University would fail, why the experiment would fail if it were to fail. Uh, and so recognizing that these were sort of dark times in the university and, and perhaps you know, it was facing some serious difficulties. And the letter wasn't open for decades uh, afterward, really over a century afterward. And they, they opened the cornerstone in the 1990s when Sage Hall was being renovated for the Johnson School of, of Business. 
and they, they got the letter out, and everyone always assumed that it was about co-education, because this building was built for co-education. And when they got out the letter and read it, uh, Ezra was actually talking about non-sectarianism again, and addressing these, these concerns that kept coming up in the early years about Cornell being a godless institution, and, and students there were immoral because they didn't have mandatory chapel services, for instance. Cornell had one of the first voluntary chapel services. So Ezra was so concerned about it that he actually wrote the letter for the, for the Cornerstone, talking about uh, a non-sectarian perhaps being the downfall of the university. So um, let, let's, uh, there, there's uh, Chad Cape here has a question that, you know, referring to this as a Sen event, and as a result, can we talk about the first or other most significant businesses that have come out of Cornell research and technologies? When did the first technology emerge from Cornell that we, in, in the way we think of it today? Well, I think one example would be if you look at the early electrical engineering department, uh, Cornell had the first department of electrical engineering in the country, uh, and it was uh, an individual, Professor William Anthony, who was, was leading that department, one of the first real you know, brilliant professors in the country in the field of electrical engineering, which was this growing field. And, and it was Anthony who built a galvanometer, uh, an early generator on, on campus, and Actually, he rigged electric lights in Sage Chapel uh, in a belfry. There, there no longer is a belfry there, but the original Sage Chapel had this, this tower. And he rigged up electric lights in it, and they're believed to be some of the first elect outdoor electric lights in the country, if not the world. Uh, and, and the story goes that you know, there, there weren't any other electric lights at the time, so students, uh, individuals living downtown in the community could look up at the hill, and they'd see these, this little beacon of light from, from the campus in the Sage Chapel Belfry. And that was really a, a, a pioneering innovation that, that came out of Cornell. You have early uh, you know, innovations in, in electrical engineering and electricity. So, so taking that same theme, uh, maybe can you just sort of go you know, 50 years hence and so forth and just what are some of the other big um, inventions or ideas that have come from Cornell in the, in the past 146 years? Well, certainly our, our alumni have been pioneers in a variety of different fields, and, and we have a lot of really interesting inventors and innovators. Uh, you have folks like uh, Willis Carrier, uh, an engineering student in the class of 1901 who became the father of modern air conditioning, really the inventor of air conditioning as we know it today. Uh, and the, the business was based in Syracuse, which is where we have the Carrier Dome named after him. Uh, you have folks like Wilson Greatbatch, who uh, helped develop the implantable uh, place pacemaker by developing, uh, working on the battery that would go in the pacemaker to make it implantable. Uh, looking at the attendance list for this event, you actually have folks like Jeff Hawkins, for instance, who uh, was the inventor of the, the Palm Pilot and the Palm Trio, I believe. Uh, so, so people who have, have been pioneers and inventors in a lot of different fields. So uh, uh, John Ware has uh, had his hand up, and I'd just like to give him another chance to ask us a question. John, are you online, and can you ask your question, please? Sure. It was the uh, question, was Ezra actually a CEO or chairman of Western Union, or what role did he uh, play in addition to being a uh, major stockholder? Uh, he, I don't believe he actually held a, a role like CEO or president. I believe he was just a, a major investor and stockholder uh, and, and wasn't involved with the day-to-day -day management of the, the business, but I'm not entirely sure on that. I think he was keeping busy with his political interests and, and sort of his involvement in the community and, and agriculture and farming uh, and sort of just investing in the telegraph industry once he, he finished laying the telegraph lines. So, so much, uh, uh, Corey, so much of uh, uh, history uh, resides in these books and these uh, uh, remnants of the m these uh, sort of messages that come to us from uh, rare manuscripts and so forth. Tell us a little bit about your experience sure. uh, in Kroc Library and what that was like and just uh, share with us and, and also whether people can come and uh, 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 participate in this pleasure. I actually was, was hired to work in Kroc Library and the Rare and Manuscript Collections as a student. It was the summer after my freshman year, and I met with the university archivist, Delane Angst, and said, you know, Cornell has such a, a fascinating history. How can I get involved? What can I do to, to help out here? And she, she hired me on the spot, and I worked there for three years as a student, and then after graduating, uh, I was hired to work there full time. And it really is a, a fantastic resource at the university that I think a lot of people never take the chance to go visit. Uh, there's, there's always a, a great exhibit on display. Uh, for instance, I believe the, the current exhibit is on legendary animals uh, like uh, the, the Cornell bear, for instance, but also animals like the, the pig from Charlotte's Web and the spider from Charlotte's Web, uh, written by Cornellian E.B. White, class of 1921. 
But the university archives is the, the repository for the university's treasures and, and most valuable objects, everything from the Gettysburg Address written in, in Abraham Lincoln's own, ha own handwriting to uh, Copernicus manuscripts and, and Darwin first editions and, and a phenomenal amount of material, and including all of the, the early Ezra Cornell and Andrew Dixon White and papers and, and Cornell's archives itself. So I strongly encourage alumni to stop by and, and check out when they're in, in town. It's, it's underneath Olin Library. If you go to the back of Olin Library and down two floors, you'll find yourself in, in Croc Library and take a look at some of the treasures. So when you, uh, what was your favorite uh, manuscript or document from the Cornell and Andrew White uh, collection. Oh, that's that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm particularly fond of of that letter in the the Sage Hall cornerstone. I think that's a really neat story and how it took over a hundred years for us to really find out what Ezra meant when he put that letter in the cornerstone. And it's not often that you have a chance to to go back and rewrite history. You you look at some of the the histories of Cornell that had been that had been written in the interim period. And they're all assuming that it was about coeducation, and historians uh, were, were wrong. Uh, it wasn't until the 1990s that we realized that. So it's neat to have be able to have a, a say in, in what, what the history was when you go back and, and, and learn something new. Now, uh, obviously, the history of uh, Cornell University is something that is a passion for you, but it's also something that's attracted a lot of attention. You are uh, teaching a course at the moment. Can you tell us all a little bit about that? That's what that right. experience has been like. Uh, it's, it's really been a blast. This semester uh, I developed a syllabus for a one credit course in American Studies uh, to be taught on the history of Cornell University. It, it's something, uh, a project I've been thinking about for a couple of years and I developed the syllabus, uh, an early version a couple of years ago. So working with a friend of mine who's a graduate student in history, uh, Tom Balserski, who graduated from Cornell 19, uh, in 2005, uh, we put together this, this course uh, and have over 100 students enrolled in it. Uh, and it meets once a week, and each week we take a topic from Cornell history. So one week we talked about any person and why that was so unique. One week we talked about athletics at Cornell and the, and the great history of Cornell athletics and the Big Red. One week we talked about unrest and activism and sort of the, the legacy of student activism at Cornell, you know, looking at the 1950s and the 1960s. So it's really been neat to, to get a new generation of Cornellians interested in, and really educated and aware of the, the role Cornell played in modern higher education and, and who the, these names are on the buildings that you see around campus every day. Uh, so when you, when you uh, I, I've, I've been, th as I listen to you, I'm thinking that when you were here as a student, uh, you probably derived a certain idea of what Cornell was about and how has that changed over time, both when you were in Croc Library, but now that you are teaching, are you seeing Cornell in a different way? I think so. You see, you see Cornell from a different perspective, each role that, that you have here. So as a student, uh, so growing up as the, the son of a faculty member and an alumnus, I got to see one, one perspective of Cornell, then as a student, uh, then as a staff member, and now uh, in some ways as, a, as an instructor. You get to see all different sides of Cornell and, and how everyone really plays a role, uh, from, from the students to the staff to the faculty to the alumni. Uh, everyone plays a part in the university, and, and each sort of constituency has had a major role over the years in shaping what Cornell is today. Uh, certainly alumni have played a huge role in that, uh, and which is one of the reasons that we have alumni elected trustees on the board of trustees, which was a, an innovation that, that not many schools had done when Cornell did it. I think Harvard might have been the only other school with a, an alumni elected trustee when Cornell started doing that. So, um, I mean, uh, as we have a few minutes uh, left here, I'd be very curious to uh, know what you think, well, since we're talking to the uh, Cornell Entrepreneur Network, uh, members of the, the network. W what are the lessons that uh, in the life, uh, life of Ezra and the creation of Western Union and so forth and so on, what are the lessons or the thoughts that you think people should go away with after this conversation? Well, there's a quote that was from a speech actually given for the 100th anniversary of Western Union uh, in the 1950s, and, and a speech was given about Ezra Cornell at that event. And it said, so long as we continue to build leaders with the high principles, strong faith, and rugged courage of a Cornell, we need have no fear for the future. And I think that that's a neat quote summing up Ezra Cornell's legacy. Uh, certainly the, the attributes that he kept with him throughout his life were you know, persistence. He had a lot of struggles uh, with a lot of different careers and, and tried his hand at a lot of things. But uh, he, he kept going. He, he, he persisted in his beliefs, a uh, strong convi conviction in his beliefs. Uh, innovation was, was keynote throughout his life. He was always, you know, he'd believe in trying something new and different and wouldn't just go with how things had always been done, from the telegraph and the plow to creating this new kind of university. Innovation was a big part of it. 
Certainly, values of, of education and philanthropy were, were also major aspects of Ezra's life, and, and really emphasizing giving back to his community and, and helping others out and, and supporting education, which was so important in, in the United States and still is today. So speaking of supporting education, uh, uh, Stuart Mitchell, I see, had asked a question uh, wanting to know uh, whether Western Union makes significant contributions to Cornell through their own uh, philanthrop philanthropic efforts? I actually don't know that. Uh, certainly people involved with Western Union, like the Sibleys, were, were major benefactors in, in the early days of the university, but I, I don't know much more beyond that. So do you, do you ask yourself uh, from time to time uh, what Ezra would think of the university today? Uh, I do. I, I think Ezra would be proud. It's, it's really unfortunate that he didn't live to see the university to be, really become successful. When he passed away in 1874, it was struggling, uh, and I think he'd be really pleased to see how far it's come and how it's really lived up to his founding vision of, of any person in any study. It's really you know, epitomized what, what he wanted to achieve, and, and it continues to, to you know, embody those ideals with, with the different colleges, different fields of study. The, the diverse student body, I think he'd be really happy if he, he stopped by campus someday and, and checked it out, sat in on a class or two. Well, you know, one of, one of just uh, from a personal perspective, uh, when uh, having gone through the last two years um, in uh, the whole effort that was called uh, branded uh, Reimagining Cornell in, in the wake of the 2008, uh, one of the, the aspects of the conversation that happened on this campus that touched me most was the durability of uh, Ezra Cornell's founding thought and people's commitment to what they thought his uh, purpose was, even at, at a time when, you know, uh, the, the heat of the moment and the, the need to move on could have, could have led to, to very different conversations. So it's very interesting to see how strong 146 years later th that, that pull is. That's true. I mean, Ezra knew what, what economic hardship was, was like, and he knew that sometimes you, you had to make sacrifices to and look at the long-term goal to, to keep your vision going. So I think he would understand the, uh, the, the challenges Cornell has faced with the reimagining, but I think he would be pleased with the decisions that have been made and, and understand that, that we have to, you know, sometimes you need to change to, to continue to be successful and grow, and, and he, he knows that Cornell's administrators have the best interests uh, of the university at heart. Now, now talking about... Uh moving on and growing and so forth and so on. Now, we, we are sort of now, as of today, four years from now, we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Cornell University. And everybody will know how to say the word sesquicentennial by then. <laughs> That's right. It's Spelling is the trick one. And <laughs> uh, there are a lot of work. I just think it's a it's good time to, to let people know that there's already committees and people are working, students, faculty, and starting to think about how uh, we will celebrate and commemorate that moment. Um, but, uh, Corey, uh, I have it that you're working on a book uh, for young people, uh, uh, children maybe. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm part of a, a project actually being led by a, a colleague of mine in Alumni Affairs and Development, Paul McGuire, who helps with these webinars. And it was her idea to create something that would help educate more people about Ezra Cornell's unique life. And you know, people should know about Ezra just as much as they know about folks like Samuel Morse and other inventors and innovators. Uh, so her idea was, was create a children's book, uh, find a way to get the word out there, raise awareness about Ezra Cornell and, and his values. Uh, so we've started this project, and, and the goal is hopefully to have some final product by the sesquicentennial uh, and to help us get the word out about who Ezra was and why he was important. You know, one of, one of the, as the Vice President for University Communications, you know, this is one of the things I worry about is how we're going to tell this story along the way. And I find that Cornellians are more than happy to stand up and be counted, uh, I am Cornell, and there you are, and there's going to be a lot of this, uh, these efforts, these storytelling efforts, and congratulations for, for taking that initiative. I can't help but notice that Stuart Mitchell has asked that uh, we provide your contact information because he is not only very impressed, but he was also taught by your <laughs> father uh, through Lead New York, and that's something, a, a moment of pride for him as well. So maybe you might just uh, give your email for, so people can reach you? Sure. The uh, best way to reach me is by email, and my email address is corey.earl at cornell.edu, C-O-R-E-Y dot E-A-R-L-E. -E, or you can email me at my net ID is CRE8 at cornell.edu, whichever is easier to remember. Create, pretty easy to remember. So I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to talk about Cornell history. Well, so, I mean, this is, I'm going to slip this one under the, 
under the door almost. Uh, uh, Chad, uh, Chad Cape is saying, I believe Ezra Cornell is involved in the Erie and Michigan Telegraph Company tying Buffalo to Milwaukee. Do you know if these activities in Wisconsin had any tie to the Wisconsin pine lands being used in funding the early days of Cornell University? I don't think there was a, a direct connection uh, with the Wisconsin pine lands. Uh, so to fill other folks in, the Wisconsin pine lands were the lands given to, to New York State uh, as part of the land grant. Uh, there wasn't land in New York State to help them out, so they were given land in Wisconsin that could be used, uh, the timber sold off, etc., to help fund this university in New York State. Uh, but So Ezra did a lot of work going to Wisconsin and, and checking out the land, and, and there's actually a community there named Cornell in Wisconsin. Uh, but I don't think he, the, the Telegraph uh, involvement there necessarily was connected to it, though I could be wrong. I'm not positive on that. Well, uh, Corey, thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. I think you will all agree with me that Corey is uh, masterful at this, and we should have him back on a regular basis to keep on reminding of this history of this important institution. Uh, thank you to all of you for participating. Uh, without you, um, these, uh, this would be a one-way conversation, and we're delighted that you're here and look forward to meeting you on another webinar or on campus soon. In the meantime, I'm Tommy Bruce. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Audio recording for this meeting has ended. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, thanks. You're very good. I learned thanks. You.